Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this special session on climate technology. I'm very glad we have such a great audience with the business leaders and leaders in academia, in government. And this is a little surprising. Right after lunch, uh, I hope our discussion can uh, keep everyone uh, awake. And climate technology is uh, uh, you know, all technology that have to do with addressing climate changes. And in climate change, we have three areas, regulation, we have market, and we have technology. For regulation part, we, uh, 2015, the world reached the Paris Agreement. And uh, it is in the process of implementation, and uh, it also has been going quite slow in, in many ways. And uh, we're, we're hoping that process will go, go smoothly. On market, as we know, China last year the, uh, just announced the, the, the countrywide, nationwide carbon market. The, I, I, do not, I will discuss about this probably a little bit later. And, uh, um, you know, so far we have not really seen sig significant progress in many carbon markets worldwide. And whether or not that is optimistic, uh, the, we, we're not quite sure yet. But a lot of people nowadays just really looking at the technology because the technology so far has brought in probably the biggest progress in addressing climate change. We have seen clean energy development in many areas. The, uh, the cost for clean energy has been consistently uh, lower the, uh, than, uh, than making the solar power, wind power, for, for example, to be competitive against the many other the traditional, conventional ways based on coal-fired power plant uh, anyway. And with us today, the, the leaders, all of them, all four of them, the business leaders, and every one of them, they are leading their company and uh, in innovation and meeting the challenges that we face today. The, uh, I would like to first invite Katie, uh, then uh, just give us quickly, you know, what you think the greatest challenges and the greater opportunities hmm. that technology can bring us for addressing these climate change issues. Sure. All right. Okay. Um, thank you. So just for quick context, um, uh, for about five years up until earlier this year, I led a clean energy um, and climate team at Apple. I uh, did a lot of work here in China investing in utility scale, solar and wind, and working with our manufacturing partners to transition to renewable energy. Um, I now live and work in Nairobi, Kenya, and invest in off-grid energy applications um, and climate technologies there. Very different, I, so I hope I can sort of help speak to very different markets today. Um, but your question of greatest opportunities and greatest challenges, I think the greatest opportunities today are to scale up proven technologies that are commercially viable as fast as possible. Um, what you described of how Renewable energy technologies and storage have come down the cost curve. Electrified transport has come down the cost curve. The um, affordable sensors and the computing power to actually use IoT technologies for efficiency in energy and other natural resources. Um, Let's I think, do this, Katie, if, yeah. uh, if I may, to interrupt a little bit. You Please. worked in for Ample for five years, yes. in the last five years. Well, now, if you want, you ask you to put your to put your money on. So, what kind of technology you you would put? Ah, uh, where, where would I where would I invest capital that's, in different that's right. technologies? Interesting. Um, well, first is the just clear business viability of a lot of existing renewable energy technologies. In many, you know, context specific, but you have grid parity uh, in in many markets for solar and wind. Um, I. I think electrifying transport is hugely important, and it's what should be invested in. Um, I guess, are you, are you saying as an investor, if I put my investment hat That's on? Right. Um, I think that the answer to that question gets to some of the, the challenges that I think is holding us back. Because at the end of the day, I don't think it is technology limitations that are holding us back. I think it's some of the structural pieces around climate technologies, not having the right long-term policies in place, not having the right um, structured finance, because a lot of climate technologies are high upfront capex, low marginal capex, whether that's solar and wind, electric vehicles, um, energy efficiency work. And so, you know, we, we need some of the right 
pieces in place in order for climate technologies to scale up as fast as they need to. Because as an, as an investor, to be honest, it's hard to get attractive returns out of climate technologies without policies that level the playing field economically for those Okay, let's. I will get back to you on that. Yeah. The, see, you know, what kind of policy would you need to, yeah. to make, to incentivize the investors to put, put their money sure. on the climate, climate yeah. technologies. Let, let me just move to uh, Dimitri. As a member of the managing board, uh, Royal DSM, I know your, your responsibility uh, has a lot to do with the innovation, but also you, you have been leading many programs within the company. And uh, I, I do understand that your company is now ranking very high on the Dow Jones, the Sustainability Index. Just tell us, with the, the, Katie didn't mention any technology that your company is doing. The, just let us uh, know what kind of technology within that company that you think is the most viable and the, for the climate change challenges. And then well, you will put your money into that. <laughs> then I will put my money in there, right. And I will try to do my best. There we go. Um, I would like to, to mention three categories which are important, and I'll come with a specific example where you can put your money on. We believe that addressing climate change cannot be done in splendid isolation. You need to do that with suppliers, you need to do that yourself, and you need to do that with consumers, customers, down the value chain. An interesting, Katie worked for Apple. Um, we just recently signed uh, an agreement with Apple on renewable energy, where we've agreed we will go to 100% renewable energy as a whole, as a company. As a company, as a supplier to Apple. Um, I think that's a part in the value chain. The second part is we ourselves have committed to reduce greenhouse gas reduction. So I think it needs to be suppliers, it needs to be to improve our own footprint, but also work with customers. Let me give you an example of one of the technologies we apply, uh, which is linked to customers, and it has to do with thinking circular. Because addressing climate change is about changing the mindset from linear thinking, you use raw materials, you produce something, you sell it, and then it's landfill or end of life. We would like to re-examine that end of life concept into circular. For instance, in the US, we have um, invested quite some money in using waste of corn stoves to make biofuels, second generation biofuels. So not the food or the, or the corn itself, but the waste of it, which otherwise would be deleted. And we make biofuels out of that. So circular thinking helps addressing climate change. Third, circular thinking is important. The biofuel, we all know it is very important. What about that, that question that uh, Katie just raised? The, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the cost of benefit, it is, is a area that I should put my, my, my money in there right now? Well, the interesting is that you need to start with innovation with trust. And you will definitely see barriers along the way. How long should I trust you? A long time, right. uh, but also a short time. Mm -hmm. The interesting is we have measured what we call ACO plus. Those are innovations which add to a better alternative to the world. Better in terms of footprint, better in terms of efficiency. And we have foreseen that these technologies and these products grow faster and have a very good result. So people sometimes think it's either you're sustainable or you're profitable. That's a wrong dimension. You can do both, but it needs some time to do that. All right, we'll come back to that. Then uh, now I move to Chopin uh, from uh, BP. We all know BP represents the uh, stand for British Petroleum, but not everyone knows. Now you have a new name, the so Beyond Petroleum. And just tell us the, uh, what does that mean, Beyond Petroleum, and what you do to address this uh, concern sometimes from people about petroleum. Thank you, thank you for that good question. Um, BP, yes, we are an uh, oil gas company and uh, used to be only oil gas, but the world uh, uh, faces a dual challenge. On one hand, we are expecting 9.2 billion people by 2040, and the energy demand growth is still very high. And we are talking about 25% uh, uh, growth in the next 20-some uh, uh, years again. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, we have to demand, uh, provide 
uh, clean, affordable energy to people. On the other hand, uh, we have also challenging of reducing uh, emissions. So for BP, we have decided and uh, launched the new strategies. First one is to produce more gas. For example, last year, out of seven projects, uh, six of them were gas projects. And this year, six projects, again, big project, four of them is gas. And that's the number one. And we're going to uh, uh, generate more gas in our mix. Right now, it's 50 gas, 50 percent of oil. And the secondly, so by doing that, by so doing you that, make it's it cleaner. lighter, yeah, cleaner lighter, exactly. in, in terms of carbon yes, emissions. Yes, yes, but that's not enough. We uh, every year we invest now about half a billion dollars in advancing low carbon solutions, as well as identify new innovations. For example, in uh, U.S., our uh, wind power already provides uh, enough power that is uh, enough for 400,000 uh, households in the U.S. In Brazil, we use sugar cane for biofuels, and the bagasse, the waste from the biofuel, we use that to generate uh, biomass uh, for the power. And in the uh, United States, we just acquired uh, a company called LightSource uh, and uh, uh, participate in a certain percentage. This is the biggest uh, solar power developer uh, in Europe. So we are trying to build our solar power presence uh, worldwide, has uh, already established lots of projects. And in addition to solar power, bio-renewables, we have lots of other innovations projects and so trying th those to create. Are, yep. uh, I guess that mm -hmm. have a lot to do with your yep. investment. What about the technology front? The, the, you know, what, what is your, your, your best technology, your silver bullet for, you know, I should put my money in? There's a lots of them, right. by the way. Okay. And the first one, um, we actually invest in a company called Solidia. Solidia is a company that actually can help the cement industry to cure the carbon dioxide. And I just uh, 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 been told from my managing uh, director responsible for the venturing business. Tell the, some of us, of, in the, myself yeah. and in the yeah. audience the, yeah. who does not really know, do not know, much about that technology. How, how does that work? 7% um, of the carbon dioxide emission right now is from a uh, cement industry. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in that process, you have carbon dioxide uh, uh, emitted. And the Solidia, they have uh, innovated a good technology, have a curing process to prevent, uh, capture the carbon dioxide. So that's really a very exciting uh, uh, project we are investing. And another one is called the Fulcrum. We also invest that uh, uh, company along with Kathy and other partners that is using waste to generate the bio jet fuel for aviation. Mm -hmm. Now we all have heard about uh, light vehicles to use EV, but what about for jet fuel? Mm -hmm. So this company has uh, identified a good technology uh, mm -hmm. that can convert uh, eventually the jet fuel using bio uh, jet because 7% of carbon dioxide in the world now is emitted from aviation fuel. So this is a, uh, another technology we are really uh, excited about. And uh, among uh, lots of other things, we are also looking at advanced mobility uh, area. The jet fuel, can I, can, if I may, uh, mm -hmm. Xiaoping, the jet fuel area, uh, kerosene, uh, how much of that you, you're doing from the, bio, the, uh, the biofuel technology right now? We are investing in this technology. We hope to bring that technology to different countries and mm -hmm. uh, make that available. How soon do you think the cost for that kind of technology can, can go down to uh, be competitive uh, compared to the, the, this oil-based? I, I think you know, sometimes when we are uh, looking at all the innovation um, uh, talents from the worldwide, from a solo, from wind, from a bio, seems like cost of uh, all this new technology being decreasing very fast when we you know, all invest and help cultivate and help to scale up. I okay. think with the new investment, I'm sure. Uh, Let's hope that, yeah, that learning yeah. curve will learning go, can, go yeah, down yeah, quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll the get big to companies that like right. BP, we just help to invest in this company, help right. to scale up, mm -hmm. and then hopefully we can uh, make the technology more cost effective. Sounds good, thank you. 
Jay, you, you're from uh, a, a place where it's also home to another major oil companies, right? The, uh, uh, I think, uh, what's it, Chevron over there? But your, but your work is the Internet of Things. And uh, we have heard so much about Internet of Things, but give us some concrete examples how this kind of technology can actually help us to reduce carbon emission to address climate, to climate uh, threat. Before I go down with specific uh, answer to that question, right. I'll address the opportunity space first a little bit. I think uh, today's era of technology, information technology, is unbelievable. The velocity of change in terms of compute, storage, and networking technologies as they're evolving is huge. So information processing, context, you know, contextualizing this information, analyzing it, creating insights, all of that can lead to good proof of value for all of these solutions that are being talked about. Mm. So information processing, information technology is the area where we are deploying a lot of solutions for like thousands of customers. But uh, in terms of IoT specifically, if you look at it, uh, what does IoT enable? It lets you sense and detect and acquire a lot of information in real time, close to real time. Getting all that information, storing it, processing it, contextualizing it, correlating it, creating analytics and uh, insights out of it, doing service lifecycle management, that end-to-end -end, uh, use cases are big in energy efficiency. I think most of our uh, people who have very expensive assets, very uh, difficult to operate, very costly to operate, they look for operational efficiency and one aspect of it is pure energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. So 10, 20, 30, sometimes the adage goes, what you measure is what you can manage. So once you start measuring, you have boatloads of information that you get, and you can suddenly get the right dial to optimize. So people are, it's an experimentation process, right? The answers are not known ahead of time. <coughs> you go do an analytics workbench, try out a few examples, and then you start optimizing. So that value realization, what we have seen with customers is around energy efficiency. That's one vector. Utilities are doing a good job in water management. We were talking earlier mm -hmm. about uh, non-revenue water mm -hmm. from source to consumption, how much gets wasted, right? Uh, just simple sensors to detect active and passive ones to detect leakage, you know, saves a lot of natural resources. Uh, so areas of uh, saving water, improving uh, from production, distribution, and consumption of energy, various opportunities exist. And uh, you know, depends on which dial you want to optimize. Uh, I, uh, we can do that. Jay, I buy this argument that the, about measurement. Measurement is so important for yeah. for addressing this energy efficiency issue. But at the same time, you know, some argue this is a for for efficiency problem. You also have a rebound effect, yeah. right? The uh, your refrigerator, the uh, used to be a very low efficiency in the past, 30 right. years ago, 20 years ago. Now you have a much higher efficiency refrigerator, but you get a much bigger refrigerator in your, right. in your home. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we address that problem with this IoT? I think from an IoT standpoint, the downside, um, as I talked about the opportunity space, I'll reflect on the downside. One is uh, there's a lot, ton of noise, uh, ton of data that you acquire mm -hmm. and you don't do much with it. So getting a very systems view, a holistic view, mm -hmm not optimizing one subsystem here or another subsystem there, but doing it holistically, uh, getting a systems engineering view of things which kind of uh, you know, up-levels you to a more macro view of the world, right? Macro view of, at a home level. You're not optimizing the refrigerator or the kitchen uh, consumption of power, for example, mm -hmm. in the refrigerator case. You're looking at it holistically at the home level, at the community level, mm -hmm. at the uh, distribution network level, so at the various levels in which the systems can be designed, uh, you then, have to start measuring and managing it. Then uh, what kind of uh, uh, Internet of Things technology are you using at home? Multiple. I think the sensor technologies are dime a dozen today. In fact, my biggest concern with the volume of sensors and data acquisition systems that have come up is about the e-waste that we are generating. I think mm -hmm. I churn out more waste at my own home with the number of switches that I have to replace every year mm -hmm. because they're not connecting to the new network, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. The point is, uh, the, simplistically, the architecture of an IoT solution uh, can be broken into three pieces. The edge tier, which is where all the sensors, mm -hmm. the data acquisition systems mm -hmm. are all there. 
you have the platform tier. So there's a lot of, lot of progress in the cloud-based ecosystem today. Right. You look at what AWS is doing, what Google is doing, what mm. Microsoft Azure is doing. Mm. All of these cloud technologies have suddenly made the platform tier very interesting and very cost effective and energy effective as well. Mm -hmm. Then you have the analytics insights and all this enterprise tier. Uh, I think in this architecture, uh, you have to have an end-to-end -end view, a more holistic view. Um, technology is not the issue, as uh, mm -hmm. Katie pointed out, even Dimitri mentioned. Like, right. There's tons of technology available. It's a, how do you construct uh, a nice mm -hmm. system of systems, a holistic view, model it, look at the use cases, drive for outcomes, drive for business value, and then, you know, proof of value, test it out, try it out. Mm -hmm. uh, one insight may be worth a ton, mm -hmm. I'm sure, and then 250 others may not be worth uh, realizing any value. Then you drop them, you go, it's still a very agile way of working. So we, we need uh, not just a single individual technology, but really we need a system. Yeah. Uh, in terms of system, we also need a better governance system. Katie, you, you raised a very important question mm. in order for technology to be uh, utilized yeah. in the real world. We really need the help from the public policy front. Mm. And uh, uh, here in China, there has been a lot of government support for right. solar yeah. technology, yeah. for wind technology. But last May, May 31st, the government decided to remove all the subsidies for solar power generation mm. and to generate a lot of complaints, of yeah. course. Yeah. Then uh, what kind of uh, public policy you mm. would like to see mm. to support? The, uh, the, where do you find the, right. the, the shortage of supply of a, of a good public policy for support, for, for supporting this kind of uh, technolog technological right. innovation? Yeah, and application, I, of course. I guess, first off, there, I think there's a a lot we can learn from what China has done really well in the last you know, five plus years around renewable energy incentives and policies and some, uh, some lessons learned of things to do better. So um, a big piece of what public policy has to do is create long-term consistency and a view of where we're going. The US has struggled because we have enacted short-term renewable energy incentives that creates a, a real um, sort of boom and bust cycle around, say, you know, wind power development. China has been good at creating long-term consistent policies um, and leveling the playing field. You have to either um, acknowledge that fossil fuel generation is being subsidized directly or indirectly, um, and if you're not going to remove those advantages, you have to create equalizing advantages uh, for renewables. Um, at the same time, I, I recognize and appreciate how difficult that is because there is the criticism that the renewable energy incentives in China were too rich at times, which doesn't foster the greatest efficiency for the technology. And this is where I think creating policies around climate technology is so difficult, and I have great respect for the people who have to work on this, um, to walk that fine line between bringing these technologies down the cost curve um, and sort of up, up to scale while not um, creating the, the wrong incentives. So for example, here in China, you have um, I think two and a half times as much solar and wind capacity than in the US, which is incredible. And most of it has been in the last few years. But only 40% more generation from wind and solar, which is saying that wind and solar in China is operating at a much lower efficiency, uh, much less productive assets. And why is that? And there are a number of reasons. So how do you Make sure you're getting the scale while you're also getting the performance from but the climate this, technology. This, this has less to do with technological innovation, though. Mm. It, here you have a large-scale curtailment problem, mm, right? That's the, part of you, it. you yeah. built the, the yeah. wind power right. uh, station, right. but you're really yeah. not really generating right. yeah. the power. Right. And that gets to actually a, right. a technology that wouldn't necessarily be thought of as climate technology, but. Um, is smart grids. I mean, if you really want to decarbonize energy systems, you need incredibly agile and intelligent grids that move power, you, you know, high voltage lines that move power across using IoT technology uh, that can immediately respond to, uh, to what's happening in the grid. That's the only way you can really get to the, you know, 65% renewable grids we say we need in order to sort of meet the the Paris Climate Accord.
With, with the existing technology that right now we have um, developed in, in China, US, mm. Europe, and so on and so forth, and now, now I know you have uh, been working in Africa, yeah. and a uh, huge continent, huge opportunities mm. uh, over there. If you are going to bring these technologies mm. to Africa to address this uh, uh, climate resilience, problem, yeah. climate uh, mitigation problem, what kind, te- kind of technology we yeah. should look at sure. to, to bring this, uh, these technologies to them? Um, so first off, I should say, you know, I'm based in Kenya, and, and one cool statistic is last year, um, 77% of Kenya's power generation was renewable, mostly hydro and geothermal. So, um, and I think there are a lot of examples of that um, in different parts of the continent. So um, we have the opportunity to keep countries like Kenya on a, on a low carbon path while we need to very quickly respond to the sort of inequality and lack of access that people have. Um, a couple things that I see across sub-Saharan Africa, 600 million people don't have access to modern electricity. Um, and that needs to be addressed as soon as possible. Um, and a lot of analysis shows that uh, two to 300 million of that 600 should be reached through grid extension. That's the most cost effective way. But another you know, three to 400 are best reached through decentralized energy systems. And I think one of the most interesting, but still economically challenging, is our mini grids. And I think that's where we may see the greatest um, adoption of mini grid technology, solar plus storage, mm-hmm. um, you know, at rapid scale with the right policy incentives. Very helpful, really. thank you. I want to uh, shift gear a little bit, uh, uh, Dimitri. I know your company, particularly your, your uh, present CEO, play a very important role in carbon financing uh, mm. worldwide. And Europe, of course, has been leading in carbon market. And uh, according to the theory that the carbon market can promote technological innovation and application. Uh, so looking at your own company, what do you th- see the, uh, the EU ETS system, this uh, emission trading system, actually helping your company meeting that goal? Yeah. Right. I think it's, it's the key question, and thank you for that. And, and that's also why I think governments should play an important role. Exactly. Right? Uh, right. To your question to Katie, and, and I would like to, to reemphasize that. It is, it is producers like us, it is consumers like all of us, and I think we as consumers can push it even further to, to buy products which are climate friendly, uh, but certainly also governments in a carbon price. Because the issue is today we live in a world where the economic system is the mainstream. And it means that if you make profit, you do well. Mm-hmm. We as a company think that is an old system thinking. You need to think about people, planet, profit. You need to le- think about a holistic view on what you deliver to the world. And we feel that waste should have a price. I'll come back to that on carbon. Hmm. Today, 9% of what we produce is circular, so it's being reused. In other words, 91% is either landfilled, incinerated, or leaked somehow in this world. That is that is unacceptable and has to change. And therefore, there needs to be a system change on how we think about our economic value. So carbon price is a small step to that. And carbon price started in several countries. And very happy to see after the COP21, there's a sort of a mutual agreement that this is the way forward. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that we started it in Europe with a carbon price where about 1,300 companies about 88 countries, uh, covering about 20% of all carbon emissions is covered today by a carbon price. It started also in Europe with a price around six euros, so six dollars, and today it is above 20. And if it's above 20 and it's creeping into the 40, 50 region, it will have an impact on economic thinking. Because then basically, you don't assume waste to be zero or a carbon emission to be zero. Mm -hmm. It has a price. And that will also favor innovation. 
climate-friendly technologies. And I think we need end, end, end. So we need push from the government, we need push from the consumers, give us and we need example. a carbon price. Give us an example of you know, how that carbon pricing, mm. the, uh, based on the carbon market system, particularly the EU ETS, actually made your business decision yep. uh, adjusted for, yeah. for technological innovation in, yeah. in DSM. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe two things. One on the strategy, it impacts quite a bit what we do at DSM and also on the product. So mm. let me start with the strategy. Mm. DSM is a, an old company, exists 117 years. Um, we reinvent ourselves based on what we see in the market. Our recently launched strategy in June is called purpose-led, performance-driven, around three business domains, nutrition and health, resources and circularity, and climate and energy. So oral innovation is around these three circles. That leads to innovation in certain fields of climate and energy. I'll give you an example. The ones we currently are, are working on is improving the solar efficiency. We're talking about data, mm -hmm. uh, big data intelligence. The interesting is, if you capture one and a half hour of sun a day throughout the year, it's enough for a year's energy. The problem is that the efficiency of solar panels is not good enough. So we develop coatings to improve the uptake and the reception of sun on solar cells. If there will be a carbon price of 50 to 100 euros a ton, then it's not only economically viable, it's one of the best products we ever developed. So even without a carbon price, it helps, but the transition, even without the subsidies on solar panels, it will help with the carbon price. So you're not only depending on subsidizing the solar energy. You're helping your customers, but do you get return? You get uh, the adequate return from that practice. All right. The interesting on solar panels is because you innovate, you can also install new business models. Mm -hmm. So we're also working on business models where we basically improve the efficiency of our customers. We will give them the coating for free, and then we earn the money back on the higher efficiency. So we have an agreement with the customer and say, hey, you don't believe on the higher efficiency? We'll apply the coating and we share our efficiency mm -hmm. improvement 50-50. Mm -hmm. A fantastic model. Great. Uh, I'm going to, Shopin, I'm going to ask the same question to you. Two very different type of companies, right? Mm -hmm. I say oil and gas company mm -hmm. started in Europe. And how do you feel, your company feel, the, this uh, uh, pressure from the, the carbon market, particularly that EU ETS we're talking about. How much of that, the, uh, the, the pressure, is actually pushing the company, BP, uh, in, towards innovation? Um, I would say, actually, BP has been advocate for carbon price for years. So it's not the pressure. It's our own initiative as well. And we think uh, cooperation, I, I agree with Dimitri, government, consumer, producer, all of us have a responsibility to make sure we actually continuously reduce the carbon footprint. So in BP, we have actually uh, energized the entire workforce, all the business, 70,000 people or more, to use a RIC framework. RIC stands for Reduce, Improve, Create, R-I-C. So we want to reduce our footprint. For example, we're committed to reduce 3.5 million tons of carbon dioxide emission by 2025, and we commit to grow our business, but don't increase the net carbon dioxide uh, uh, emission by 2025 based on uh, uh, 2015. And we lead the industry to say, we want to meet methane uh, intensity to less than 0.2%, for example. We want to do that because it's uh, our strategy to have advanced uh, solutions. Improve, uh, uh, for example, the PTA technology. PTA is a key raw material for our fiber fabrics, etc. Our technology we improved in such a way that carbon dioxide emission is 65% lower mm -hmm. than other technology, as example. And when you improve our, uh, for example, the uh, emission from uh, uh, the fuel, transportation fuel, I mentioned a little bit uh, more uh, before about the biofuel, uh, et cetera. And then we also use biosynthetic 
uh, lubricants, for example, and uh, working on the additives okay. to ensure we can improve uh, that as well. Let, yeah. me, let me just further yeah. ask this question. According to the mm -hmm. Paris Agreement, yeah. the world is going to decarbonize the economy by the middle of this century. Mm -hmm. it's, just look at it. It's not too, too, too far from... Uh, I know many of us sitting here will see the end of a fossil fuel age. Mm -hmm. And how, how would a company like yours to adjust to this uh, new target set, you know, by the world and for the world, right? Yeah, I think, you know, if we can grow business without uh, growing carbon dioxide, identify all the uh, solutions, that's a really good thing. Do you and have a strategy yes, to face out? Yes, right? yes. We and how does that work? Yeah. So, so, so beyond far, petroleum, mm -hmm, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And uh, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, the, if I just may talk about the PTA, we not only created good PTA technology and processes, we also created product called PT Air where we help consumers to use our product in a carbon neutral footprint by you know, creating some other kind of carbon credits. For example, we just invest, uh, announced the investment with the Ilium, a forestry company in China. We will increase the forest uh, uh, footprint so that we can reduce the carbon footprint. Once you make your commitment, says well, I want to grow business, but without increasing net that's, income tax, there's lots of ideas and innovations coming. But that's from more it. of on the sideline, the, yeah. the you know, into a corporate social responsibility area rather than a mainstream business strategy, though. Right. Well, main business strategy I mentioned about uh, switching to more gas as one example, okay. and looking at our me methane uh, emission, for example, how the fugitive emission can be reducing our operations, and uh, 3.5 million tons of carbon dioxide reduction, net reduction by 2025, all these are the commitments that you have to identify in lots of areas. Energy efficiency, uh, Jay was talking about, we are looking at all the uh, options for modernizing our operations as well as digitalizing so that we can be efficient. And lots of things need to be taken but place. But natural gas, that's a still, well, first of all, it's still part of the fossil fuel and it's considered to be a bridge fuel. And that still, you know, will have to be phased out uh, at some point, right? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. That, I think that that's why, you know, I mentioned about uh, us investing half billion dollars a year in looking at renewable energy, mm. wind, mm. solar, bio, biofuel, biopower, biojet, uh, and all these uh, holistic solutions. Mm. We move toward bio. To so renewable. To beyond renewable, petroleum, renewable. Yes. beyond gas, yes. we go, yes. go, go toward yeah. bio. Well, yeah, pretty soon, I, I'm yeah. going to uh, invite everyone uh, from the audience for their comments and, uh, and the questions. Katie, you have a question. You, well, you I have was just, a, uh, you know, right. on the natural gas topic, right. this is a really tricky one if we're talking about um, kind of a low carbon future because it is much, it is lower carbon by many measures. It is a cleaner fuel than, than other fossil fuels. But you build a natural gas plant and you've locked that power mm. capacity in for decades. So um, to this question of what are the technologies we should be investing in now, I think there's an important debate and a healthy tension around um, natural gas helps us get on a lower carbon pathway, and that's right. very positive, especially for countries that don't have sufficient energy capacity today. But it's hard to call it a bridge fuel if it ends up being a few decades. The bridge right. is a few decades long, right? And we don't bridge. have that right. kind of time. So, right. um, so it's an important debate. Th thank you, Katie. Uh, but uh, I still want to come to uh, Jay. The uh, you know the theme for this uh, annual meeting this year is about the the fourth industrial revolution yeah. and also innovation, innovative society and the economy. And uh, speaking of uh, measurement, you you just uh, uh, mentioned and measurement technology for say carbon dioxide concentration, yeah. greenhouse gas, the uh, concentration in the atmosphere, the measurement. Just tell us the uh, you know how this IoT technology actually helped to advance the measurement, to capture the, the big picture, you know, where we are. We, we know we are much higher than 400 ppm part per million by volume in the atmosphere. This is compared to 280 pre-industrial level. And, uh, but we want to get accurate measurement of, of this everywhere in the, in the world, help us 
and even down to maybe to business level and also to the, the household level measurement. What, 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 what can we get from, from this uh, advancement in technology? Right? So uh, just to answer your question, the sensor technologies themselves have gotten way advanced, right? In right. terms of the margin of error, the sensitivity levels, calibration of those sensor technologies has reached a point where you can get good, good data points. Now, how does information flow and whose sensors provide these information points? That is another big challenge today. Mm -hmm. you, we talked about gaps. Opportunities are there, but the gaps are that information flow across the world at different places, different organizations, data flow, information flow is still very constrained. Access and transparency is still very constrained. Mm -hmm. You don't have uh, visibility on a timely, so that you can do interventions on a timely basis. You don't have access to that kind of uh, infrastructure. So the, while there is a significant hype around the IoT space, mm -hmm. where you know, there's a lot of point of proof of value, proof of concepts, mm -hmm. scale deployments happening, it is still not at a level of maturity where the volumes are significant that we have a global footprint which gives us accurate, mm -hmm. seamless pieces of information. Mm -hmm. So the center actually, that is one of our motivations in joining the C4IR in San Francisco. The idea is that whatever reference solutions we build, whatever implementation guides we put together, mm -hmm. that can be globally diffused. Everybody in every part of the world gets it. I'm very happy to see the China center uh, getting open today. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan is done, India is done. So across the world, I think the, the governance aspect, the policy aspects of deploying these technologies needs to become more seamless. I think we still have significant gaps there. I did want to talk to one point that you had mentioned about mm. efficiency of the wind farms. Yeah. Despite high levels mm. of implementation volume, mm. the efficiencies are lower. Yeah. So in fact, you know, we did a lot of work around how these windmills actually operate and mm. how you can optimize. You can, if you squeeze out five, seven, ten percent per windmill, but now you look at a larger construct of, a larger system of larger collection of windmills, mm. right? How they operate together as one farm. Yeah. How they operate across. So the system of systems principle, right? Applying mm. those uh, and leveraging them to optimize at a much higher level. Mm -hmm. There's still ways to go. I think while I'm all excited about the technology aspect saying compute, Storage network technologies are amazingly good now. It continues to go down this price performance value chain. Uh, increased performance, lower price, uh, but we still have a lot of ways to go. Great, I would like to invite the first round of questions and comments from our audience. And uh, for those of you, please identify yourself first and uh, you know, put it in a very straightforward way, the, uh, please. <laughs> Hi there, my name's Dr. Fiona Beck from the Australian National University. I'm one of the young scientists community. I'm interested in what the panel thinks about the, um, uh, about the, the possibility of a hydrogen economy for deep decarbonization. Mm. Um, there have been uh, several national um, from Japan and Australia and international reports about the uh, unique uh, possibilities right now about mm. um, the emergence of a hydrogen economy. Thank you very much. The prospect of a hydrogen technology. Let, let me just collect a few more questions before we move on. Right, uh, gentlemen over there, please. Um, uh, hi, my name is Jake Okechiku Afodu. I'm a global shaper with the Abuja Hub. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to make reference to the gospel about the Paris Agreement trying to decarbonize the world by the mid of the century. It's not something many African states would say amen to because mm -hmm. it doesn't really make a business case for them. And the options are quite limited because in terms of producing these technologies that are green technologies, we don't really have the resource to produce them. Mm. So I wanted to ask if you thought about technology transfer and how you think that might work. Because mm -hmm. with the fourth industrial revolution, these technologies are just incrementally changing and advancing. And we just can't catch up. And we can't make money from these technologies. Mm -hmm. We don't produce them. What do you think is the solution? And I know Kenya is a good success case yeah. Yeah. but Nigeria is quite different because yeah. you know I'm, I'm sure you know the peculiarities about my country mm. but what do you think would be the solution for these states who actually want to do something about like climate change but none right. of these mm. things are working sure. for us mm -hmm. that Thank question you. is for you Katie because he, he, he was looking at you <laughs> sure uh, yes gentlemen over there please I, uh, I'm Vineet Mittal from India uh, mm. we had set up uh, first large grid connected solar system in India way back in 2010 mm. 
uh, when we got uh, the tariff of 32 US cents uh, per kilowatt hour. And yesterday, we won a 500 megawatt project at three and a half cents. Wow. And we are not losing money. And uh, there is no government incentive. Mm. So what China and Germany have done uh, over the uh, last eight years uh, is to innovate and uh, bring down uh, because of the scalability and advancement in technology. Mm -hmm. The cost has uh, come down drastically. And uh, if private sector cooperate like say Apple or Google, they start uh, buying energy directly from players like us in Africa and India. And uh, government doesn't get bullied by the thermal power producers because now we are cheaper than them. So in India, the thermal power is close to 9 to 10 cents. And on the exchange yesterday, it was sold for uh, 30 cents. Uh, so if uh, thermal powers are becoming less competitive despite all the mm -hmm. subsidies, whereas solar and winds are becoming more competitive in uh, uh, India and in uh, Africa also in three countries, uh, we, have, uh, we are doing projects at almost 40% uh, of uh, their conventional power cost with the storage. Mm, uh, right. So it is becoming, uh, it's becoming more competitive, uh, more reliable and you can uh, uh, take out the unreliability part with the batteries and innovation. Thank you. Thank you. I'll prob probably leave that question the to back. the two gentlemen. Yes. Uh, over here, uh, I have uh, the, the last question for the first round, please. All right. Hello, I'm Marjolein Helder, one of the tech pioneers of the World Economic Forum. We produce electricity with living plants as a new sustainable energy source. So listening to the discussion um, and like framing it in the fourth industrial revolution, um, I'm missing a bit of courage. So you're telling like we're investing half a billion every year into renewables, that's less than one and a half percent of your total profit. Sorry to say, but so I'm, I'm sort of, I would like to challenge all of you to come up with some like really bold ideas, like what are the really big things that we could do like to turn this around? I hear you say, well, we should invest in scaling up like existing technologies, mm -hmm. like stuff that has been proven. So what about the stuff that's coming? Mm -hmm. If we, for example, don't want to go through gas to renewables, mm -hmm. but we want to skip gas and do like renewables at, the, at once, which would be mm -hmm. obviously better for the environment. Mm -hmm. So what could we do? Uh, can you come up with some really like challenging ideas, bold ideas that we, well, that will all of us make us happy? <laughs> well, thank you very much. I think that's a terrific question. I want to uh, our speakers to address that and everyone, everyone in the audience who would like to take on that mm -hmm. challenge. Please just, mm -hmm. just go ahead. Let's, let's just uh, uh, take care of the first round of questions. Katie, let's mm -hmm. start from you over here, right? You, know, you have particularly, right. I'll, you know. I'll take the question that sure. I think was directed my way anyway. Um, I think you raise a really good point, and this is one of the important sort of ethical discussions to be had around kind of the whole, the entire movement towards a low carbon economy when you have a number of emerging markets that haven't yet fully electrified their countries um, and have major energy scarcity issues. Um, but I think to, to what um, the gentleman here, the solar developer in India said, um, I think it's sometimes a false trade off to say that um, these technologies are more expensive because in Nigeria today, I believe that something like two to four gigawatts of diesel generators get installed every year. It's huge. And that's a very expensive cost of generation. So if that's your benchmark, there are tons of renewable technologies that are, that are more compelling economically than fossil fuels. It's, I, I think it's more of an execution challenge than a pure economic benchmarking challenge. Um, but I, I do think you raise a really important point around getting more of the value-added services happening locally as opposed to just importing the technologies to the extent that we can be doing more local manufacturing of, of this kind of equipment and creating um, sort of business opportunities locally, that's when it starts to really take off. Thank you, Katie. For that hydrogen question, uh, can I uh, ask you, Shogang, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, Wait. this is just not only beyond fossil fuel, it should be beyond fuel itself, right? We are just moving into a very, very different uh, yeah. area of uh, energy. Yeah. Right? So BPA actually um, just published our new technology outlook, and we try to look at all the 
uh, uh, research papers, results, uh, worked with academics, as well as other uh, research institutes. And we set together, do some kind of outlook. It's all about the views, isn't it? And uh, that view is, we view the hydrogen uh, fuel cell technology is going to be competitive by middle of the century. That's what we uh, predict. Of course, it depends on lots of things, right? How much you put in, and uh, what is the technology breakthrough, and the government support, among other things. But we do view that could be a very uh, a sustainable, competitive technology uh, in the uh, middle century. But if I may, I also like to uh, uh, answer Please. that question right. about uh, how can we take a bold uh, move? I've been in this industry for over 20 years. And um, I really want to have a magic bullet. But the funny thing is, the more I know about it, the more I found it's so complex, so difficult. It's not just one magic bullet. Mm -hmm. It really needs to have everybody in BP, as well as everybody in the oil and gas industry, to work together to come up with a solution in every, each aspect and process, consumers, mm -hmm. producers. That's why uh, our CEO, Bob Dudley, has called uh, you know, 10 oil and gas companies together. Form, he is the chairman of OGCI, Oil and Gas Climate uh, Initiatives. We want to work together to say what's the solution for the world to meet the Paris Agreement and to come up with a solution that can provide the heat, uh, light, mobility to people who want to have good living, mm -hmm. as well as the carbon dioxide issues. So it's a journey, and I'm glad we have made a lot of progresses, but it's not uh, one solution fits all. It's just very, very complex issues. Well, we just hope that journey yeah. is not too long. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah yes, please. Yeah, I want to build on, on the request on, on right. being a bit more bold. Right. Yeah. Um, because it hurts a little bit, right? Sure. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, asking, yeah, are we bold enough? Well, I think yeah, we are, enough. but right. it's defensive. But yeah. I think it's fair. It's a fair yeah. challenge. And I think certainly here um, around the World Economic Forum, we should be challenging ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and I was firstly thinking, what if we are not bold? Don't worry, because others outside our own establishment will be bold, right? So if Good we don't point. make it, fine. Good point. Yeah. In right. some of the cases, I don't even think you should bank on the establishment because they will work against new things because they have their own legacy assets, right? Mm. Exactly. I'm slightly more positive um, on what's happening over the last five years because we get acceleration. And, and I will give you an area where DSM plays a role and that's in electrical vehicles. Uh, we produce materials for electrical vehicles and we work with customers which we didn't have two years ago. I mean, there are companies in China who didn't exist two years ago and have just launched a full electrical vehicle last week in March. So these companies are really bold. And I feel that we are bold to work together with these, but it's a bit indirect. But, so I get your point. Let me think about it before becoming defensive, but it's a fair point. Yeah. I think we all need to be bold, but I'm also with them, with Xiaoping, I don't believe it will be one technology that will make it work. I think it will be a multitude of technologies working against a better future. And the beauty is that after the COP21 agreement in Paris, we are on a highway with different technologies and different approaches with different speeds. But at least we're heading into the same direction. Well, you just mentioned that word acceleration. Mm. The, uh, uh, actually, that is a key feature for this industrial and technological revolution we are talking about. The good news is, if you look at the major economies, you can see accelerated transition from a high carbon energy to a lower carbon, yeah. carbon ener energy system. For all ma major mm -hmm. economies, including the United States included, mm -hmm. The uh, China, UK, you know, uh, Europe, uh, all have accelerated in the last decade, which is really good news. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, so Jay, would you like to the, address that question? Just uh, uh, mention, you know, different countries have di different stages. Then uh, uh, you, you know, you guys talking about this uh, probably state of the art technology, but still we, we need to look at the specific economic and the political social situation. 
and when applying to this technology in a holistic way. Right? From, a, from a capability standpoint, I think everybody around the world wants mm -hmm. the very best of capabilities. So you can't dumb things down in terms of the value proposition. In terms of the cost, so I'm just talking about the, mm -hmm. the, the grid, the smart mm -hmm. grid example you mm -hmm. used. Putting a small edge gateway that does analytics at the edge and figures out where to source the power from. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a simple algorithm running in a simple software container, running in a little hardware mm -hmm. at the edge, at the consumption endpoint, mm -hmm. right? To just now creating one for US market, creating one for Europe market, for the Asia market, South American market, African market. So again, the pricing model, the cost involved in producing something like that mm. to get consumed, we cannot compromise on some of the uh, capabilities that because people expect a good uh, level of capability. It's about how do, you, how do you build technology that is sustainable and globally deployable. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have had significant challenges in that because uh, uh, a product or a solution built for the US market may not sustain in some other markets. Mm -hmm. uh, but over, over time, what we have noticed in the last two, three, that's the hope, is in the last two, three years, there's more democratization of technology ingredients, there's more availability and price performance value has gotten much, much better. Mm -hmm. So it's reaching a point, at least in uh, the last financial year that we had, where some of these solutions are very effective. Mm -hmm. And at best, you don't have to go through a massive proof of value return on investment justification process to adopt some of these technologies. But we still have challenges. I think the price mm -hmm. of compute storage and network will continue to go in a good direction. Uh, so we will keep building these solutions with the center uh, and kind of diffuse them globally. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's an interesting time. Yeah, let, let, to be bold, let me just ask the, the audience here, especially those of you uh, who have been working in this technology area, those of you mm -hmm. have young, bright minds and uh, uh, some <laughs> terrific ideas. Yeah, and I got this uh, young, bright minds over here uh, tell us, how you, how you take this challenge? About, about being young, I'm not so right. sure. But uh, right. I'm a physicist at CERN, and I want to give you an example of the difficulty yes. of innovation. CERN, CERN uh, the, yeah, just tell us, stand for. Sorry? Yeah, it's phys what is I'm, CERN? I'm, I'm, for people who oh, don't know what CERN, CERN is. CERN is the, uh, in, uh, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. That's right. the place where we discovered the Higgs particle uh, for fusion, a few years right. ago. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's the place also where we invented the World Wide Web, among other things, we, right. uh, and many other things. What I want to say is that, um, to give you an example of how difficult it is to propose innovation if it doesn't have anything to do with wind or solar energies. Mm -hmm. uh, at CERN, we have mm -hmm. demonstrated technology that would allow to use thorium as a primary energy source mm -hmm. and, and make thorium a sustainable source of energy. Now, nuclear energy, nuclear industry, sorry, does not like it. So we, uh, since government listened to nuclear industry, mm -hmm. we don't get instant institutional uh, funding. And then the private uh, sector doesn't like to invest in something that might take 10 to 15 years right. before they make money. So how do you get out of this type of dilemma that uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't work either way, but we as physicists are convinced that this is certainly something that has to be uh, to be studied you know the issue of uh of, of fossil fuel is so serious that I think you cannot exclude one direction of, uh, of research, especially when the basic technology has been already demonstrated hmm. yeah that's a very, very interesting comments the uh it's really hard to to look at you know beyond wind and solar nowadays talking about clean energy mm -hmm. uh, and CERN you have a lot of innovation going mm -hmm. on over there mm -hmm. just pro perhaps just tell us a little bit more that the uh, you know what are the challenges as a scientist innovators mm -hmm. you face for well, what would you like to see to facilitate your, your innovation well, I, I can give you an example. For example, we have uh, collaborators who have designed a special accelerator that would uh, produce a high power beam in a very compact way and mm. in a very uh, cost eff effective way compared to other things that are developed. For example, in, in China, there is one project also, accelerator driven system, 
which uses a LINAC. Uh, we have developed a cyclotron that would make this thing uh, cost effective. Mm. Now we submitted uh, uh, you know, a, a proposal for funding uh, to the European uh, Union. And uh, you, know, you know, you can guess what happens. It's reviewed by at least one person from nuclear industry, and they, they just uh, say, no, thanks. It's great, but no thanks. Mm. And uh, it is the difficulty we, have, uh, we, we are facing. So we, uh, well, I, I hope you understand the, the difficulty. But this technology has been demonstrated. We've done experiments at CERN mm -hmm. that have, uh, have, have verified the basic concept mm -hmm. of uh, such uh, systems. And then all the components exist. You know, in Sweden today, somebody's, some people are building the European uh, neutron spallation source. It's a, a beam of five megawatt. With five megawatt beam, you can, uh, with the system we propose, uh, make unit of 100 to 200 uh, megawatt electric mm. uh, power uh, for one billion euro of mm. that order. I mean, this mm -hmm. is a rough estimate because you have not done the uh, industrialization. But uh, I mean, these things are realistic. Mm -hmm. However, it doesn't seem to be uh, happening because we don't get any, uh, thank any you. help. Mm -hmm. Th thank you very much. I, I understand we don't have a lot of time left. Thank you very much for, for raising the hand. Uh, I uh, probably just go real quickly uh, around uh, mm -hmm. the table here. The, uh, you know, now we're in the fourth industrial re revolution in 20 seconds. How are you prepared for that? I think uh, I'll borrow the one line statement, be bold. Be bold and uh, mm. test and try out, don't hold back on innovation. And mm. Katie, um, so well, you, you moved to Africa and mm. uh, you know, waiting for the, uh, or I don't know, not waiting, preparing for the first revolution yeah. technology, right? I mean, that's where I think there needs to be sort of an equitable distribution of where the investments are going for climate technologies and energy infrastructure. Equity for everyone. Thank you very much. Inclusive. Right. I'm a stubborn optimist, so I think we'll make it work. Uh, remember this room 10 years ago, there will be no smartphones. All right. Look how that changed the world. So I'm a stubborn optimist. I think within 10 years from now, we're here, we see a completely different world, a and better world. Thank you. And BP, how are you prepared? I like the word of being bold as well. And our CEO says we want to grow business, but without growing carbon dioxide emissions by 2025. That's very, very bold. And uh, we are more energized by ever to put our thoughts, our efforts, everyone's efforts, to make sure we can face the challenge, providing the energy to people who need while reducing uh, come with our set missions. Being bold. Thank you very much. That concluded uh, this round of a discussion. I want to thank all, to all of you for your participation. Apologies to all of you who have a lot of questions and uh, comments. And uh, stay tuned. Come back next, next year. Thank you so much. <laughs>